Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back. If you are new around here, my name is Tucker. I serve as one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. And we are in this series, A Psalm for Every Situation. The truth of the matter is we all go through things in life, ups and downs, emotionally and otherwise, mentally everything. And this, this whole series is geared toward uh, how the Psalms uh, kind of vent every human emotion and, and give us some guidance and as well as the rest of the scriptures on how we ought to process through the different emotions, the different feelings that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. And so today we are talking about an all-too-common thing, that of loneliness. Um, to start off, we are going to start off with perhaps the saddest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 88. And I just want to read the final verse in that psalm. It says, You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. You can tell that psalmist is deep in the pit of loneliness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your graciousness to us. Lord, for all the young adults who are tuned in right now, Lord, whether at a campus or watching this online, uh, Lord, they are going through different things in life. Many of them are probably walking through a season of loneliness right now. And Lord, I simply ask that you would use this teaching, the truth from your word, to guide them, direct them, so that, Lord, they might find what their hearts are truly longing for. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you're at a campus and you're still on your feet, go ahead and plop down and get comfy. So loneliness, loneliness, as I was just praying about, is perhaps one of the most common things in our culture, in particular um, in this generation. But it is not just common, it is actually also very destructive. You and I both know that it's no fun to be lonely, but did you know that loneliness actually negatively affects your physical health? I came across one article and I want to quote it for you. It says, loneliness has been associated with the progression of Alzheimer's disease, obesity, increased vascular resistance, elevated blood pressure, increased hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical activity, say that five times fast, less healthy sleep, diminished immunity, reduction in independent living, alcoholism, symptoms of depression, suicidal ideation, and behavior, and mortality in older adults. That's a lot of health problems that come from being lonely. In fact, the, the, the link between loneliness and uh, disease, the, the link between loneliness and our health is so strong that did you know that scientists could actually look at kids who are growing up and based on how lonely they are, they could predict how many of them are going to wind up with risk factors for heart disease by the time they become young adults. Loneliness has a profound impact, not only on our emotions, but also on our physical health. But it gets even worse. What if I told you that loneliness is contagious? That you can catch loneliness like you can catch COVID. Like that it can spread throughout a community, throughout a group of friends, throughout a relationship circle, through, throughout a, a family, that loneliness is actually contagious. Get this, one study found that at one degree of separation, like you have a friend who is lonely, if you have a friend who is lonely, you are 52% more likely to be lonely yourself. But it gets perhaps even worse because not just at one degree of separation, but at two, if your friend's friend, not even your friend, nobody close to you is lonely, but if your friend's friend is lonely, you are 25% more likely to be lonely yourself. And even more so at three degrees of separation, your friend's friend's friend, if they are lonely, there is a 15% more likely chance that you yourself are going to experience loneliness as well. Clearly, this is a problem. It is pervasive in our culture. Uh, people have said that we are experiencing a loneliness epidemic in our society and in our culture. It's wreaking havoc on our health, and apparently it's contagious as well. I don't want to catch loneliness. So please, Tuck, can you help us right now? Me? Not so much, but God's word 
Absolutely. How do we deal with loneliness? That's what I want to unpack in a message that I've entitled The Cure for Loneliness. The Cure for Loneliness. So how do we cure loneliness? Honestly, that depends on what type of loneliness we are dealing with. As I process through my own life, uh, life as a pastor and counseling people, as well as surveying the scriptures, uh, I come up with three specific types of loneliness, and I want to break each one of them down for us and show us how we find the cure for that type of loneliness. So the first one, if you are taking notes, write this down. The first one is isolated living. Isolated living. My opinion, this is the most common, especially for this generation. Um, This is the one that I would describe as the one that, that our society talks about as the loneliness epidemic. And biblical characters were not immune to this. I came across a couple of them in my studies. Uh, Elijah, for instance, felt alone. He felt loneliness over in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you look through 1 Kings 19, 1 through 10, we won't read the whole thing. Um, But Elijah has just come off of Mount Carmel, called fire down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice. You who've been around the scriptures for a while probably remember that story. Uh, And as a result of that whole act of God, uh, he has the prophets of Baal or Baal um, slain. And so they are killed because they were leading the people of Israel astray. And then King Ahab's wife, Jezebel, she hears that he killed all the prophets of Baal and she is not happy about it. And she swears that she is going to kill him within the next 24 hours. And so he is scared. He runs off with his servant, leaves his servant in a town called Beersheba and then goes a distance of about one day's journey. And we pick it up there in verse four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. This guy is one day into isolation and he is already so miserable, he's crying out to God, asking God to kill him because he doesn't want to keep living. He goes on from there in verse five, it says, and he lay down and slept under a broom tree and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord, that is uh, most likely Jesus. We don't have time to get into all of that today. But if you see the angel of the Lord in all caps, Lord is all caps. That's talking about Jesus came again a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Now, he's like 41 days into isolation, 40 days into being extremely hungry. And he is lamenting to God how alone he is, how he is vigorously, passionately stood up for the Lord and yet he alone is left. He's not the only one who experienced loneliness though. The Apostle Paul seems like he experienced loneliness over in 2 Timothy. In the book of 2 Timothy, he is writing to his young protege, Timothy, uh, and he says uh, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 16, At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, he says. When Paul was on trial for his life for the sake of the gospel, no one stood with him. They all abandoned him and he was left alone and seems like he experienced some feelings of loneliness. There's another person who experienced loneliness in the scriptures, Jesus. If we go back to the book of Matthew chapter 26, In Matthew 26, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane the night before he is going to be crucified. And in verse 38, it says, then he said to them, 
talking about Peter, James, and John. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? He seems discouraged that his boys, that Peter, James, and John, they could not even stay awake for one hour to be with him in prayer. He seemed to be lonely. Now, I see something common across these three different characters, Elijah, Paul, and Jesus. Each one of them was facing imminent death. Elijah has Jezebel on his heels trying to kill him. Paul is standing trial for the sake of the gospel with his life on the line. Jesus knows that the cross is going to be, uh, uh, that he is going to be hung on the cross the very next day. All of them are, are facing impending death. And in that experience, they have this sense of loneliness that I'm by myself in all of this. Now, I got to be honest with you guys. As I survey the rest of the scriptures and did as much research as I could with the, the, the amount of time that I had, uh, to be honest with you, I wish that I had weeks to prepare for this message because those are the only three characters in the Bible that I can find who experienced loneliness the way that you and I think of loneliness. Why is that? This is a genuine question. This is not a, a rhetorical device. This is not an oratory device. This is a genuine question that I have. Could it be that the characters in the Bible rarely, if ever, experience the loneliness that you and I experience? If these are the only three characters that I can find in the scriptures who, who felt anything like loneliness and, and being alone and separate from other people and, and on their own, could it be that they actually did not experience loneliness? Even more so, if that's true, then why in our world today are we experiencing a loneliness epidemic? Is it possible, again, genuine question, is it possible that our loneliness epidemic is not just a byproduct of living in a broken world? It's not just a natural result of living in a fallen world. Could it be that our loneliness that we experience in our world today is actually being self-inflicted? I want to meditate a little bit with you guys on the scriptures as well as some kind of recent data that has been published about this generation and its experience with loneliness and things like that. So let's start off with the biblical context. In the Bible, they had a very communal culture. It was common for multiple generations, for, for children and parents and grandparents, even great-grandparents, to all be living under one tent or under one roof or at least in the same little community with one another. Um, they did life together. Uh, they lived in a society where, where other, other tribes or other groups might come in and try to invade them and, and attack them, and so they had to depend on one another compared to our culture today, where we are a hyper-individualistic culture, where we live by ourselves, where we, we spend a lot of time alone, where we, we try to forge our own way and, and break from our family ties and, and make our own way in the world. And not all of that is bad, but we, are, we live in a far less communal culture today. Even more so, this loneliness epidemic didn't start decades ago or didn't start maybe, maybe several decades ago because in Western society, people have been kind of being more individualistic than, than perhaps the, the first century Jew might have been for a long time, even for, for a century or so. So why is it that now in particular, we are experiencing this loneliness epidemic? Let me share a little bit of data with you guys. I know, I know, data, like, stick with me. This will go fast. I, I recently read a book called uh, The Anxious Generation. I'm a, a, everything that I'm about to talk about uh, kind of comes out of that book. And in it, uh, they pose a couple of different graphs, and I want to show you these. For one, 
teens, uh, which if you were like, I'm not a teen, the data is when you were a teen. So just stick with me here. Teens are spending a lot more time on screens than they used to. See, teens in the 1990s, which is probably not anybody who is tuned into this, or maybe it's a small group leader, shout out to you guys. Uh, they watch less than three hours of screens a day. The lion's share of that, if not 100% of it, was TV. That's really all that they had. But then fast forward through the 90s, and internet shows up. Fast forward a little bit more uh, into the early 2000s, and now high-speed internet so shows up. Uh, in, the, in the, like, 2000 to 2010 or so, social media starts popping up. We have MySpace, you guys probably don't even know what that is. Uh, Facebook shows up, Twitter comes around, Instagram shortly thereafter, and that. And all the while, in 2007, the invention that arguably changed the world, the iPhone was invented and hit the market, which now took all of that internet and all of that connectivity and put it right into our pocket to have access to 100% of the time. To now, the modern day teenager is spending two to three hours more on their devices, on their iPad, phone, computer, television, whatever. And let me be clear, we're talking about leisure time. We're not talking about doing homework or anything like that. We're talking about they went from less than three hours to almost six hours, like doubling the amount of time that teens are spending on screens. And you and I are probably not that much different, even though we are no longer teenagers. Now, where did that extra time come from? Well, here's the second graph. They are spending less time with their friends. Because they're spending more time on screens, we're spending less time with one another. In the graph, you can see in particular the line for 15 to 24 year olds from 2003 to 2020. Back in 2003, the average teenager spent roughly two and a half hours with their friends a day. Fast forward to 2020, that number falls all the way to 40 minutes a day. Now, some will say, yeah, but 2020, the pandemic had just popped off. And of course, no, no, no. If you look at that trend line, it doesn't bend when it gets to 2020. They are already on a trajectory going down, down, down in 2018 and 2019. This was a very big decline in how much teenagers were spending time with each other. Now, I can already hear kind of the rebuttal in people's minds. But whoa, 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 tuck. I get you, but I do spend time with my friends. We text all the time, we DM all the time, we're posting on social media, we're commenting on each other's stuff, and I get that. But I wanna, I wanna give you this, this quote from that book that I mentioned earlier, The Anxious Generation. The author, Jonathan Haidt, says this, talking about, in particular, social media and managing all of it. He says, such social labor creates shallow connections because it is asynchronous and public. Unlike face-to-face -face conversation or a private phone call or video call, and the interactions are disembodied. They use almost no muscles other than in the swiping and typing fingers. Let me translate that for us a little bit. When you and I engage in any type of digital communication outside of a, a phone call or a video call, it is asynchronous, which means there is not immediate feedback that is given, right? If I'm talking to a person, they typically are going to be nodding. If they agree with me, they might, hmm, oh. And that immediate feedback creates security in me. They're listening to me. They like what I say. Their eyes get wide when I say something They're like, oh, oh, they didn't like that or they were surprised or they were shocked by that. That is synchronous type of communication. Asynchronous communication is where I say something or I type something and now I have to wait. Whether it's a text message, a DM, a social media post, I send it and now I'm waiting. Did they like it? Do they not like it? Do they agree with me? Do they not agree with me? Not even with social media, just think about your text. When you see those three little, little dots and you're just sitting there and waiting like, oh man, oh man, oh man. Like that anxiety that is there, it's because the communication is not... Uh, it's because the communication uh, is asynchronous rather than synchronous. And secondly, it's disembodied. See, when you and I speak, most of our communication is not the words that we're saying. 
It's the tone of our voice and our facial expression and our body language. And when you remove a phone call or a video call and it's just in a text form, that, that, that disembodied communication and that asynchronous communication creates far more shallow connections and relationships, which is why you and I if we are constantly connected online, still wind up feeling so lonely inside because God wired us for in-person visual connectivity that we see each other, that we hear each other, that we can feel each other. That is how God made you and I. This is why I am submitting to you that I think that it is very possible that our isolated living, that our feelings of loneliness is the result of our doing, not just living in a broken world, but we are actively making decisions that are contributing to our loneliness. I'll never forget my first kind of leadership position in a church. I was uh, put in charge, of one of the people in charge of our high school ministry at the church that I was a part of back in Oregon. And, and some of our high school kids I, I was blown away. They would, they would be at school together and then they would rush home, get on the computer to get together in a virtual space so that they could hang out with one another. I'm like, hold on. You guys like are hanging out with each other right now and you're all going to go home and you're going to get online so that you can hang out with each other. Not like other people from another school or a friend back in the state that you moved from or something like that. Like, same group of people, you're going home to hang out in a virtual space. Now I get, I'm making myself sound super old and out of touch, but like this is just something that I care a lot about because I care a lot about you. God designed you for real life relationship, not just a virtual one. And I get that there are, there are risks inherent in being in a real life relationship but the reward is far, far greater. I think isolated living is the first type of loneliness and the way that we break through that is we simply step into real life, in-person conversations with one another. We put our phone down. How many times have we seen a group of people, a group of friends, a family or whatever, maybe even ourselves, out at a restaurant sitting next to each other while we are all on our phones? Right? I saw one place, somebody posted, hey, is anybody going to go and sit next to each other and look at their phones in a cool place? Like, not are we going to go hang out at a place, we're going to go sit next to each other while we look at our phones and, and exist in isolation. The solution to isolated living, that type of loneliness, is to simply step back into real life conversations and real life relationships. But there's a second type of loneliness that I want to unpack for us. This one is by far the most common in the scriptures. Remember how I said uh, that, that through the scriptures I could only find three people who experienced this, this isolated living type of loneliness, right? Uh, Elijah, Paul, and Jesus. Here's the second type, the dark night of the soul. It's what theologians for, for a few centuries now have referred to as the dark night of the soul. And it is this common experience that the saints, uh, whether Old Testament or New Testament or through the church age, have experienced where they, they walk with the Lord, but they go through a season where God himself seems distant. That passage that I read at the very beginning out of Psalm 88 is a perfect example. The psalmist, while he does say that he is uh, without friends, the majority of that psalm is directed at God and going, God, where are you? God, why have you done these things to me? Another example uh, would be Psalm 130. I want to read it for us. It's only eight verses, so stick with me. It says, a song of ascent. It says, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 
The psalmist there certainly has hope, but you can hear the lament in his voice. He is crying out for the Lord because God seems distant. He knows that God is faithful, but in this moment, God seems distant. Why? Why is it that so many Christians, um, so many ancient followers of the Lord have experienced this? Why might you and I experience this? I think we get an idea from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That verse is probably the most common claimed promise from God's word, even by people who are not followers of Jesus. Everybody got that thing plastered somewhere on a wall, on a refrigerator, whatever. People are like, God has good plans for my life. And we love to claim that promise. But do we ever claim the verses that follow it? In particular, verses 12 through 14. It says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The key here is in verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, not part of your heart, not some of your heart, not most of your heart, all of your heart. You see, throughout the years, throughout the millennia, God has, has kind of withdrawn his felt presence from his people in order to draw them closer and closer to him. I know that this is true in my own life. You see, when, when I had kind of my come to Jesus moment freshman year in high school where I started following Jesus because I believed in him, not just because that's what my family did. In all honesty, I followed him because I found him to be true. I wrestled with, with kind of the, the arguments and, and the philosophies about other religions versus Christianity and I found Jesus to be the most reliable and so I said, yes, I'm committing my whole life to Jesus. But as I, I witnessed other Christians, friends, even family, they seemed to have this intimacy. That the way that they talked about the Lord was, was in such a passionate and an intimate way and I'm like, I don't really get that. Like I'm doing it because I know that it's right but I don't get this intimacy that people have enter in a dark, horrible season of anxiety and depression. And through that season of darkness, I cried out to the Lord like I have never cried out to him before. And I sought the Lord like I had never sought him before. And I pursued him and I read and I prayed and I worshiped like I never had before. Because if I ever stopped, my mind was gonna spin out on anxious thoughts and put me further into depression. I felt like I had to worship and pray continually. And I tell you guys, I would never want to go back there, but I'd also never trade that season for anything because it was through that kind of separating where, where I'm going through this and, and my mind and my emotions are betraying me and I'm praying that God would deliver me and he just won't. Through that season, I gained an intimacy with the Lord that is more precious than any relationship that I have. I love my wife. I love my children. I love our church but none of it compares to the intimacy that I have with the Lord. Maybe you feel like you have good relationships, but maybe you're in a season where you're just like, God, where are you in my life? Maybe you're going through the dark night of the soul and maybe the Lord has actually not abandoned you, but he's calling you into a deeper walk with him. If it's that type of loneliness, the solution, the cure, is to seek him all the more, to read, to pray, to worship like you never have before. But I would be willing to bet that there are some of us, we're honest with ourselves, we're, we're evaluating our own life, we're like, honestly, I've got pretty good relationships. I feel good about the, the friends and the community that I have. And to be honest with you, I feel like I have a good relationship with the Lord. Like, like God doesn't feel distant to me Maybe you are in this third category. Maybe you are in a season of aloneness. That's my own kind of definition, a season of aloneness. Perhaps you are a person who you have good relationships. 
you feel like you and the Lord are, are, are having a, a good, strong intimacy, but you have a desire to have a romantic relationship and it just seems to never quite be the right time or the right person. Or maybe for, for some of us, uh, we, we have a good relationship with the Lord. We've got good relationships with other people, but for one reason or another, schedules changed or whatever, and we just keep winding up by ourselves. We, uh, our friends don't have the same schedule that we do anymore, and we just keep winding up alone and by ourselves. Again, these are common experiences for believers. In the scriptures, we see a, a couple of different people who experience them. Paul, uh, again, Paul in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 17, he's talking about after he met Jesus, after he had the, the, the road to Damascus experience where Jesus appeared to him. He says in verse 17 of chapter 1, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. See, God called Paul after he was converted away to Arabia and Paul spent that time reading and meditating and learning how all of the, the Old Testament and how much he had learned about the Old Testament. He was an incredibly well-studied Old Testament scholar. The Lord took him away and through that season began to show him how what the Old Testament said was all pointing to Jesus and it prepared him for his ministry that was to come. Jesus, Jesus had the same type of experience in Matthew chapter 4. After Jesus comes up out of the water at his baptism, in Matthew 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And then the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. Jesus coming up out of the waters of baptism, not Anything else compelled him. The Holy Spirit himself compelled Jesus out into the wilderness to fast, to pray, to seek the Lord and to do battle against Satan's temptations for 40 days and 40 nights. See, there's something mar that I think is, is clear and key in a season of aloneness is it is intentional and purposeful. It's not just like, oh, I'm all by myself, so like I'm alone and this is my season of aloneness. No, no, no. In Paul's case, in Jesus' case, they went and were by themselves to grow, to learn, to be strengthened, to be prepared for what was to come. See, if you are honest, and I hesitate to even say this because I'm nervous about everybody who falls into that first bucket of isolated living. I'm afraid somebody in the isolated living category is going to be like, yep, I asked one friend to hang out and they said no, so I'm in my season of aloneness and then they're going to go back to their phone and continue to be feeling lonely. If that's you, no. Like, you got to put some work in to build some relationships. It, it takes effort. It takes energy. It takes vulnerability. I realize that those can be scary things, but man, it is so, so worth it. But if you can honestly evaluate and be like, I, I really have good relationships. I, I'm not making that up. I'm not trying to make myself feel good. I really know I have good relationships. I've got a good relationship with the Lord. But I just recognize that in this season, God just keeps having me by myself. Then this is my encouragement to you. Is to pray and to genuinely ask, God, what do you want to teach me in this season? God, what do you want to teach me? How do you want to prepare me? How, and, and maybe even ask this, how should I invest my time so that I come out the other side of this season prepared for all that you have in store for me? That's my hope and prayer for you. Is that if you were isolated in your living style right now, that you'd put down your phone and you would come back into relationships, real world relationships. If you are, are a person who Man, you, you've got good relationships, but God feels distant. Man, I want to encourage you to seek him all the more. If you're a person who you're like, my relationship with God feels good, my relationship with people feel good, but I just wind up by myself, man, seek the Lord and ask him, God, what do you want to do in this season? You, I see you drawing me out into the wilderness. Lord, would you teach me? Would you grow me so that I'm prepared for all that you have in store for me? Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then that's going to be hard. 
But the beautiful thing about the scriptures and the beautiful thing about the way of Jesus is the Bible says that today is the day of salvation, which means if you are willing to believe right here and right now that Jesus is the son of God who died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again, guaranteeing you eternal life, and you're willing to repent of those sins, which is the Bible's word for to turn around, that I've been living my life this way, and I'm gonna turn around, I'm gonna start living it his way. If you're willing to make that commitment, then I wanna invite you to pray a prayer with me as we close. Would you guys bow your heads and close your eyes across campuses? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for those who are in that space right now, who know that they need to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you're in that space, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer in your heart after me. Say, Father God, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've fallen short. I ask that you would forgive me for my sins and wash me clean. I ask that you'd fill me with your spirit and lead me in the way everlasting. I make you my Lord, my Savior, and my God. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you made that decision, congratulations on the best decision of your life. We would love to celebrate with you. If you're at a campus, make sure to head over to one of the small groups, share that with the small group leader. Uh, and then, hey, if you're watching this online, go to cfmiami.org connect, fill out the connection card and check the box that says, I gave my life to Jesus. So we can follow up with you and help you take your next steps in this journey. And you don't have to be alone because you have a community that loves you. See you guys. Bye.